Okay, great. Welcome back, everyone. Uh, as we continue on with our SQF North America Focus Day, next up we have Mary Yu's Vice President of Technical Services, Tracy Sheehan. Tracy manages the team providing Mary Yu's customers with auditing, consulting, training, and labeling services. Uh, previously, she has served as the Chief Health Quality and Sustainability Officer for Aritza, as well as the Senior Vice President of Food Safety and Scientific Affairs for Sara Lee Corporation. Tracy is a founding member of the Board of Directors for the Food Allergy Research and Resource Program, also known as FARP, at the University of Nebraska. She received her PhD in Analytical Chemistry from the University of South Carolina. Speaking on preventing recalls from allergens and labeling, please welcome Tracy Sheehan. Thanks, Jonathan, and uh, let me share a screen here. How does that look? Looks great. Great. Uh, thanks for the introduction. <clears throat> and we're gonna focus today on recall prevention uh, through allergen management and labeling. And so similar to what Jeff talked about in microbial uh, assessments, you need to really start with a risk assessment. And there's a lot of places that you can gather information in order to make that risk assessment for your facility. You wanna start with how prevalent are allergens. So if you look at the food allergies in the US, there's a study that's saying it's about 5% of children in the US and about 4% of adults have food allergies. And there's also an estimate of 17% of those uh, food allergic children have sesame allergy. And in this slide and others, I leave the references if you have any questions and we can provide that after the session. So what's the major risk for allergens? It's anaphylactic shock. It, and what is that? It's a generalized shock reaction of the body. It can cause multiple organ failure. If not treated immediately, it can be fatal. And the reaction generally occurs within minutes and death can occur in less than one hour. <clears throat> it's estimated there are about 20,000 emergency room visits annually due to anaphylactic shock and allergen uh, reactions and about 1,500 to 2,000 deaths per year. And you have a one in 800,000 chance of dying from a food allergic reaction based on uh, industry statistics. So everyone should be aware of this because the deadline was January 1st, but the Congress passed the Food Allergy Safety Treatment and Research Act called the FASTER Act, and it added sesame as a major food allergen. So instead of the big eight, we now have a big nine in the U.S. And the key was that you need to have all food introduced into interstate commerce on or after January 1 labeled appropriately with sesame. Um, note that, you know, it kind of does not apply to meat and poultry. The act does not. But FSIS, uh, USDA has said that they will allow sesame in the contained statement to be in alignment with FDA regulated foods. One other thing I want to point out is, you know, Health and Human Services also had to report back to Congress on prevalence and severity of food allergens, trying to work on allergy diagnostics, onset of food allergens, the risks, therapies, and really recommendations for evidence-based modification of the list of major food allergens. And I'll just point out one thing here. The WHO, uh, FAO has had two different uh, major workshops looking at the prevalence and severity of food allergens, and they're making recommendations on a global basis of which allergens should be uh, regulated. So look, look for more information to come from WHO. Uh, back to sesame for a minute. <clears throat> it is regulated as a major allergen in over 30 countries, uh, including Canada to our north. And uh, this reference also comes from the uh, FARP uh, in from, um, International Regulatory Chart listed below. One thing that FDA uh, said afterwards, I want to read this exactly because they clarified using sesame in the ingredient statements 
So in response to a CSI, CSPI petition, FDA issued a response saying our laws and regulations do not permit the addition of sesame or any other major food allergen on a label in the ingredient list or the contained statement if that major food is not used as an ingredient to make the food. Um, they're confirming that the use of allergen advisory statements such as may contain uh, can be used, but cannot replace GMP uh, practices. And this would mean, can you clean between runs effectively? And this is sort of a newer uh, interpretation. I know there are some companies that have used um, sort of last ingredient as, as other options. Um, <clears throat> if we talk about preventive controls, um, is that the regulatory compliance is a good place to look for things that may be helping you in the plant. Um, the first thing I like to point out is with the FISMA controls, the owner, operator, or agent in charge of the facility is criminally liable to comply. This does not say the QA manager, so it's usually the plant manager or owner. And so my question is, should they have PCQI training and certification? Should they have something like SQF practitioner training to make sure that they understand the impact of allergens and other food safety uh, concerns within the FISMA Act um, on their own personal uh, job description? But I will point out, you know, the uh, FDA regulations have separate sections, and I'll just point out a couple of highlights. I've listed the actual uh, reference, but like personnel, I've seen best practices where companies have completely separate outer garments when you're um, running peanuts versus non-peanut product, and they have to switch out between uh, moving between lines. Uh, separate gloves, maybe different color gloves. Um, on the plants and grounds, I've seen separation of operations by location, uh, meaning a separate wall for allergens um, and even separate receiving. I've seen separation by time where you run the allergen last. Uh, I've seen sort of temporary partitions be put up. Uh, you want to make sure that those are effective if you're using that type of operation, uh, because sometimes they're less effective than a, an actual wall. Um, you want to look at airflow systems. Um, I know Jeff talked about compressed air. There are other things where the allergens can get into uh, and dust control systems to make sure that they're cleaned uh, after running. Enclosed systems, things like CIP and other effective means. Um, and then, of course, sanitary operations requires that the testing surface be cleaned and testable. Um, and then you want to look at, for equipment and utensils, one thing that gets missed a lot is seams on food contact surfaces, things like mixer bowls or other um, uh, conveyance uh systems that are enclosed. A lot of people don't look at breaking that down and looking where the seam is still intact. Um, for process controls, uh, one of the major things is labeling of rework. Uh, we've seen a lot of companies that maybe just put, let's say dough is a constant rework within a facility that's making pastries and they'll put dough in a container and just put it back in, but they're not necessarily labeling whether that's an allergen or not. Preventive controls, uh, you want to look at labeling and sanitation controls, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. So on a global basis, you want to look at what global allergens are there, what's their prevalence, and what's the, your risk assessment for your facility. So the ones on the left are the big eight or big nine now. Uh, with the addition of sesame, the number in the parentheses is the prevalence of that food allergen in the population in the U.S. And, and you can see the reference. So I kind of put them in order, uh, peanuts being the highest prevalence of food allergy, followed by milk and shellfish. And so you can see when we get down to sesame, we are getting a lower prevalence within the whole population of that. And so at what point do other ingredients become on that list of big eight. And I'll just on the right hand side show you that in other countries around the world, there's a lot of other allergens that are required 
on the labeling side. And one of the big ones that's a, a catch uh, is Canada requires mustard and other cereals with gluten that is not prescribed in the U.S. And so companies that are shipping between those two countries sometimes miss that. And then the European Union has a larger list that includes things like celery and lupin. And then some countries um, like Japan and, and others uh, have more nuanced things, especially with, with relation to fruits, mango, peach, kiwi, tomato, we've seen listed. And then latex, I always like to call that one out, even if it's not regulated in, in the US, in your country. You know, some companies are buying natural rubber gloves and they're used in food handling where you're touching food product and there have been allergic reactions to this. So there's options of switching to non uh, or synthetic gloves as an alternative, just as a precaution. So what is SQF certification uh, requirements and what things could they add as uh, preventive controls? So um, really, I, I just said, think that uh, SQF wrote a really strong code and you can leverage that as part of your internal audit, as well as all of your programs to meet the SQF code. And I know uh, Leanne touched on a few things, but I just highlighted some of the major ones that are specific to allergens. Um, 2.3.25 is raw material suppliers must notify a site of a change in allergens. A best practice here, um, I've seen companies put it in their supplier contracts where you have to be notified at least three to six months in advance of those change in allergens. So you have time to make your own labeling changes. So that's uh, something to think about. Um, in 2.4, products must comply with allergen legislative and regulatory requirements, and this gets into the global allergen list. So if you're shipping products around the world, you need to make sure that you're compliant with whatever country you're shipping to. Uh, there's a whole section on 2.8.1 on allergen management, and it really has a lot of details into what's required, including sanitation validation. Um, they also touch on allergen management training uh, and the importance of that for all employees. Um, that They have a section on prevention of allergen cross-contact with equipment and utensils, and then protective clothing to prevent allergen cross-contact, similar to the U.S. FSMA requirements. So let's talk a minute about allergen control plan best practices. And some of these are regulated, uh, some are in SQF code, and some are just um, through experience. But I think it's important to share best practices on uh, potential uh, prevention strategies. So you have to have an allergen control plan in the US and other countries uh, are similar. But one of the things it starts with is new product development. What restrictions or options do you give product development on developing new um, ideas? And should, if they add an allergen, should it make a discernible difference in the product from a sensory perspective? Are there limits as to whether you're adding an allergen at what level? And can we add allergens as late in the process as possible? Let's say you're making a cereal product and the allergen is a peanut additive put it in at the very last stage before packaging, and that way you have less cleanup in the process before you get to that allergen introduction. So I think it's important to develop product development guidelines and, and best practices in ways that um, they can help with the allergen control plan. Similar to that, and this may happen at product development, maybe it happens at scale up, but allergen harmonization harmonization by line, by facility. If you're a large multinational company, uh, you have the ability to do this. I know some companies may have candy operations. Maybe they run all the non-peanut products on in one facility and peanut products in another facility or have wall separation between uh, the peanut and non-peanut as an example. Uh, it's not always possible if you're one facility and you're uh, making a lot of different allergen products, but it is something to consider if you have that capability. 
uh, supplier allergen control plans. We talked about the contracts to make sure that you get notified. I think it's also helpful if you're looking to your suppliers to be SQF certified or any GFSI certified scheme that requires an allergen program, because allergen control is not the same in every country. So especially if you're buying um, ingredients from suppliers that are outside the U.S., you want to make sure that your uh, requirements are as stringent as the country that you're making the food in. And you can also consider testing, but you also probably want to consider either your own supplier audit or using a third party for a supplier audit uh, in that case to make sure that they have effective programs. You want to do the allergen risk assessment, and we talked about some of the places where you get that information on what the allergens are, what, how much of the allergen you're adding, um, and make that risk assessment in your HACCP plan. Uh, one thing that we used to forget a lot is cafeteria risk assessment. And this could be things like, what do you allow in the cafeteria? Can our peanuts allowed in the vending machine? Can people bring uh, peanut butter sandwiches to work or do you restrict that? So if you've done that assessment and you are allowing some of those things, what's your control, whether it be garments, hand washing, gloves, what's your control when they come out of the cafeteria to make sure that they're not bringing that material onto the processing floor? Uh, employee training is key, and I, I can't stress enough how important it is for employees to understand what the allergen risk is and that it could lead to death, and also understand what their role is in protecting the consumer. And one of the things that a lot of people miss, they'll do an annual training, but they miss those new employees so make sure that you get new employee training uh, done for allergens and other food safety issues. And best practice is also to, to test for competence uh, and make sure that you're training in the language that they prefer. So the testing for competence kind of lets you know, do you need to do any retraining? And, and some companies offer services for this like we do, but uh, I really think that's key in making sure that the whole food safety culture is right for the allergens. Allergen labeling verification. Uh, I think there was a question in the chat. Um, <clears throat> it's very important to do label checks. And um, Leanne even gave the example of doing a label check every hour and you missed it because it was a short run. I think it's very important to do that allergen label check, but also I've also seen where they will attach the label to the form so that they know they've taken a label from the line and it's verified that that allergen is supposed to be there. Some other things that uh, really proactive companies are doing, they're using bar barcode scanners of the finished package and linking that back into the formula that's running. And so that you have an automated check in addition to maybe a, a frequent manual check. And I've seen a lot of times where that catches uh, things uh, as near misses uh, before they go out the door. Um, engineering and system design. And the reason I say design is, you know, a lot of times the engineering or maintenance department orders new equipment and they're not necessarily including quality or management in those decisions. And I think it's really important for quality and sanitation to be part of those decisions and looking at, is the equipment cleanable? There are a lot of conveying systems out there. There are some conveying systems that can be disassembled in five minutes or less and easily cleanable. There are other systems that have niches. Uh, one of the classic examples, it was a slicer that had a niche and that led to some listeria issues, but it can also lead to allergen issues. So you wanna make sure that sanitation and quality teams are involved in those engineering and system design uh, discussions. And if it's too late, you're not getting new equipment. You also want to make sure the whole team is involved in evaluating the equipment you have for things that could be hang ups during the sanitation process. Uh, one benefit of this is as you work together, you can often find ways to improve the effectiveness of sanitation, but also reduce the time of sanitation. So sometimes there can be a cost benefit to this as well. 
Um, receiving and storage, probably one of the most common things found in an audit is that I've stored an allergen over a non-allergen in the racking system. And most racking systems don't have a uh, uh, solid uh, shelf. It's typically open. So when you send that pallet back and you've got like a half a bag, that bag can trickle down to the product below. So um, some best practices are to store all allergens on the floor, a uh, certain distance away, but mainly making sure those allergen bags are resealed so that they don't have a risk of transferring into non-allergen product. And then we always recommend to have a scheduling allergen matrix. If you are having a rat, right, uh, run allergens on the same line. Uh, you can have the matrix that tells sanitation and operations which products are in which order. So I'll give the example, a cookie product and you're running sugar cookies first, then maybe you're adding a tree nut and then maybe the last product has peanuts and tree nuts. So you wanna make sure that you're scheduling the most difficult to clean last and then if, there, if you're going from, say, um, walnut to peanut, then you want to make sure that you've got an allergen clean in between those because not all people are allergic to all of the peanut and tree nut allergens. So you want to make sure that you've got somebody in quality or use an outside consultant that can look through your scheduling allergen matrix and make sure that it makes sense from a food safety and, and protection perspective. Couple more. Uh, so you want to, in addition to all the things before it goes into processing are important, but you want a processing allergen control plan. And you really want the operators on the line to own that and own that it's effective. Um, and an example might be, do I need to put curtains up in between running or something like that? What's the cleaning mechanism of the curtains? Who's responsible? All of the things that happen during processing, you want to make sure that those are effective and that we're not moving allergens through the processing of a non-allergen product. Um, you want to try allergen containment. So I mentioned uh, it's a, it's wonderful when you have a separate facility for allergens. Uh, next risk, next lowest risk would be a separate uh, walled offline uh, for allergens. But if not, you want to make sure that you've got at least some minimum containment of those allergens. Um, some of the most common issues are rework, trim, recycle material, and hold material. Uh, I can't tell you how many times I've been in the industry and, and stuff that we put on hold doesn't stay on hold and it gets shipped. So you want to make sure that you've got control over everything that has an allergen in it before it gets packed and even after it gets packed to make sure that the label is correct. Uh, we talked about the packaging changeover checklist, so I won't go through that again. Um, and we've got examples of these if you need some help on the consulting side. Uh, I talked about the video label scanner uh, synchronized with production formula. Um, I've, I've seen um, also there are newer vision systems that don't just mo uh, monitor the barcode. They can read the entire ingredient statement <clears throat> and check for um, accuracy. And sometimes this is helpful. I've had, I had one situation where the printer sent us the label. It had the ingredient statement, but it was missing one line of the ingredient statement due to a processing error, error on their end. And something like a vision system would have uh, caught that. Um, maintenance tools. So many times maintenance carries tools throughout the facility as they're working on equipment throughout the day. They need the same training for when they need to clean those maintenance tools after using them on allergen uh, contaminated equipment as they do for sanitation of raw and ready to eat from a microbial perspective. Many companies I've seen have separate maintenance tools that are in ready to eat versus raw or allergen rooms versus non-allergen rooms. If you can't afford that, you wanna make sure that you have a program to clean those tools in between those risk and high risk areas. It's always important to have a map of your facility and track personnel movement. You want to know where people come in, where do they go, if they're running allergens, what's the protocol in between moving from that allergen line to a non-allergen line, or even moving from that allergen line to the cafeteria or other areas. So you want to make sure you've got personnel movement down pat. Uh, sanitation, of course, is number one. 
to get that. And it's very hard. One of the reasons the allergens are so um, difficult to clean is they tend to have a lot of protein, like a peanut or a tree nut. And so you, you really have to use uh, a wet detergent and sanitizer uh, to get that off the equipment. And you want to verify and validate. And I'll talk about that, uh, how to do that in, in a couple more slides. And then last thing is really auditing and documentation. That could be your internal audit. It could be your SQF audit. Sometimes it's a customer audit, but you want to make sure that you're following up on all the nonconformities found and taking corrective actions. And then the last one I like to recommend is develop an alleged consumer allergic reaction form with a crisis management plan for complaints. Um, you know, sometimes the front office is taking complaints and they don't always understand what an allergic reaction is, but you might also include questions like, um, somebody calls in and says, I bought this product that was uh, M&M's or, or a product of chocolate, but it's got peanuts in it. And they're not even allergic, but it gives you an indication that it's maybe mislabeled. And so that's another thing that you can add to your alleged consumer reaction form. Let's talk about allergen labeling. Uh, and I know that was a hot topic in the questionnaires. Um, allergen claims uh, typically uh, include allergen free from statements on the front panel. And I'll just use this example of this icon. Uh, there's a company called Menu Trinfo, and they offer a certified free from uh, standard now. It's accredited by ANAB. And so you can use this logo, but it includes a review of uh, the ingredient information as well as an audit. And, and we can do audits for that. Um, we also can do audits for um, other, you know, free from standards like gluten free. Um, allergens also uh, can be the ingredient statements and those can be either bolded or maybe you can use a parenthetical. There's two different options in the US. Um, allergens can also be called out in the contained statement like contains milk and soy below the ingredient statement. One of the benefits of this is the food allergic consumer, um, it tend, they did a survey and it takes them three times longer to do their grocery shopping because they're reading every single ingredient on that label. And if you do a contained statement, it is very helpful for them uh, to read that separately. The only thing you want to make sure is that contained statement matches what's in the ingredient statement. You know, precautionary allergen uh, statements are uh, often used and allowed. Um, there is no uh, formal regulation around these in the U.S., uh, but it gives information about the line or facility, like may contain milk and peanut. This one actually, um, the Food Allergy Research uh, Food Allergy Network uh, did a study saying that of all the statements that are out there, the may contain statement is the most likely for a food allergic consumer will avoid that product. And that's really your goal as you want to make sure that they're not eating that product if you think it's a risk. Whereas made on equipment, sometimes that food allergic consumer is making personal decisions that maybe, maybe they think it's less risk than the may contain and they would avoid it a little bit less and then the made in the facility uh, that contains other allergens. Um, and another thing that is technically could be considered allergen labeling is religious statements. So if any of you have like kosher par certification, uh, that technically allows one part in 60 of milk or 1.6%. So that would not be uh, a low enough level to um, protect milk allergic consumers. So we have a, a system called Safety Hut at Mary U, <clears throat> and it tracks all of the global recalls that are happening around the world. And this analysis uh, it would be just for allergens. So when we look at the allergen recalls, and I just pulled the major ones uh, kind of for the US, and uh, I think I added mustard for this one. But if you look at the number of recalls on a global basis, this last run was 334 for milk, but the key thing I wanted to point out is it's up 30% from last year. Uh, wheat uh, up 68%, and then the number of sesame recalls rose 261% globally uh, versus last year. So you can see that the 
companies are paying more attention and making these recalls uh, voluntarily, as well as probably more regulatory activity. Um, this also shows, if you look at the, the countries that are making the recalls, the most were in Japan, followed by the United States, then Belgium and UK. And so um, this sometimes can be helpful as you're looking at um, where these allergens are coming from, because this information also tells you if it was an ingredient and what types of ingredients. So sometimes some ingredients may be more high risk than others, things like spices maybe. So you can use this as part of your risk assessment process. The other thing I ran was um, products that made an allergen-free claim or a gluten-free claim. And last year, there were 48 products recalled making this claim, and it was recalled because the claim was not true. And so if you look at the food types that had these uh, recalls, um, and the numbers aren't right, sorry about that, but it's prepared dishes and snacks, which makes sense, followed by cereal, bakery, and confectionery in terms of the products that are making allergen-free claims that, that, aren't, uh, that caused recalls. So when we look at recall prevention and allergen labeling, you wanna make sure you're developing and updating any label changes. We talked about supplier questionnaires that you can use for every ingredient, um, the contracts for the three months, uh, developing ingredient statements based on that supplier data, uh, making sure you're carrying it through and updating that. Uh, you can consider supplemental allergen statements we talked about and, and precautionary statements. Um, I'll just caution that anytime you put an allergen uh, on a statement and you have other products that are non-allergens, you really want to talk about validation. And we've got some slides on that. And then reviewing the labels, how do you do that? Um, you can consider third-party experts to review um, new or updated labels. And we have labeling capabilities in over 100 countries that, that uh, we can do that. And we have allergen uh, training uh, that's global as well. You can review and document all the labels at receiving prior to storage and usage. And I've seen where I mentioned the lock codes. You can use a vision system. You can use a, a manual process. I've also seen people take, um, and this is an old fashioned way to do it, but take transparencies of the label and they will put it over the new label so they can see if there's any movement. Uh, did it miss a line or is there anything wrong? So that's kind of an easy way for the receiving uh, person to be checking those labels as they come in. Um, then you always want to review and document the labels at packaging changeover. It's the most common cause of recalls. It's not the most common cause of recalls is not that sanitation changeover. It's that I put the wrong label on the wrong package. So one other call out, and I've had this happen, uh, packaging with inner allergen labels doesn't match the outer allergen labels. Things like snacks that are multi-snack format, where you've got individual uh, snacks that may be labeled separately. You've got to make sure those allergen labels are the same. And then <clears throat> one uh, sort of other best practice is don't store labels on the shop floor. Only bring those labels that you're running to the floor and keep all the other labels somewhere else. Uh, I've also seen where they're in a separate warehouse and the clerk issues the label per product run and requires sign off that uh, they've been issued for that product. So think about label management as a major uh, allergen prevention uh, plan. So talk a couple minutes about allergen testing. Um, you, if you're looking at uh, internal testing or external testing, you want to make sure the lab um, is accredited to ISO 17025. If you look at SQF, uh, they're saying any food safety um, testing that, that a company does should either be ISO 17025 or equivalent. So you wanna make sure that the allergen testing that you're doing uh, meets that standard. The lab should have validated methods for all allergens needed uh, in your process. The detection limits of the allergen method should be adequate to meet the free from claim made or meet the sanitation changeover. There's multiple um, platforms or method options and we'll talk a, a little bit, another slide on that. 
The labs need to meet FDA requirements for import alert sampling and testing. So we've seen uh, a number of products get caught at the border for import alerts. And uh, we have a lab that does testing to, and, and documentation to help companies get out of import alerts. Um, so you might wanna make sure that the lab's using the correct method for that. Um, they have a quality management system and you can share the frequency and results of proficiency testing upon request. So if a lab is doing your allergen testing, they should be doing proficiency testing. Um, and expert uh, expertise and know-how. So the laboratory should be responsible for the validation study in that food or ingredient matrix. So I don't know if you know, but many allergens are difficult to detect in certain food matrix. And chocolate is one of those that's notorious. Um, the kit manufacturers spend a lot of time making sure they can detect in multiple methods and your lab should be supporting you with that. And you want to also have availability of experts for allergen consulting and crisis management. Um, on a worldwide basis, uh, you want to use harmonized kit availability uh, and for data comparison. And one of the reasons for this is the kits have a little bit different formats um, and methods. And sometimes you're detecting a certain protein of an allergen and other times you're detecting multiple proteins. So you want to make sure those kits are measuring the same if you're using multiple kits. And then the harmonized quality system uh, between labs for global companies. So when we talk about the methods, ELISA method is probably the most common for food allergens. You want to make sure it's specific for the allergen you're looking for. So for example, there are tree nut allergens, but there are also some like walnut allergen methods that you can use specific if, for that uh, ingredient. The, advent, the advantage, um, <clears throat> it reacts to the proteins directly, and probably the biggest advantage is it's quick. Right, you can on the ELISA kits. You can either use a sort of a dipstick format, like you do in a COVID test or a pregnancy test, or you can use sort of a semi-quantitative method um, using a, a plate reader. There is a PCR method. These are more used at sort of advanced laboratories, not typically at a plant level, but there is that possibility. Um, and you're looking at the DNA fragments of the allergen and they're um, captured for, and they're allergen specific. It's quantitation uh, is not as accurate as ELISA, I'll just point out. And ELISA has been used a lot longer in the industry. Uh, more advanced test is uh, uh, LCMSMS, and that's really um, primarily used if you're doing, say, a screen of spice ingredients and you want to run, run all the allergens at once. Sometimes that can, uh, uh, LCMSMS could be more cost effective than running each individual kit separately. And so it's more used as a screening tool. And some of the regulatory agencies are using that method as well, which is also helpful to know. Um, so the allergen testing, uh, you want to make sure you're um, substantiating your claims. Uh, the consultant or the facility should create a test plan to minimize the risk of recall. Uh, you want to use a validated test method. Do not use, I do not recommend using ATP or protein only based kits. And there's some other major uh, customers that will not allow that for allergen testing. Um, really the other ones that I mentioned are gold standard. Um, you want to conduct additional validation spikes in the food or allergen matrix to make sure you can recover and it's above the detection limits. So as an example, the allergen control plan testing should include the finished food, uh, should not contain the allergen at a detect detectable limit. Ingredients used to make the finished food should not detain the allergen at a detectable limit. The sanitation validation study typically is using swabs um, with uh, either swabs separately and they should be non-detectable or swabs plus finished food. And in that case, if there could be swabs that test positive and the finished food is negative, it's best to repeat the study, but you have seen also uh, where the swabs are on one piece of equipment and they change that sanitation and they'll use the finished food result. Um, line separation distances may require allergen dust migration testing. So in some of the dry operations where you're using maybe vibratory 
conveyors. I've seen a large amount of dust and those allergens can migrate between lines and you want to make sure you're validating that there's not enough allergen migrating that would cause an allergic reaction. Verification testing of adequate ingredient segregation. Um, this may or not may not be needed depending on how you're segregating ingredients, but it's something to consider. Uh, and then finally, you want to make sure that you've uh, got a formal validation report that summarizes all your testing. It includes your sanitation SOPs and your methods. And companies like us, we can go out and help you with the validation report and the whole validation setup if needed. So some watch outs, I just want to call out. Um, and this is for validation and in general. Um, soy lecithin is one of those ingredients. Uh, we tried uh, with a petition many years ago to get FDA to exempt soy lecithin um, from the list of allergens that we need to worry about. They did not agree to that, but they have come in with separate petitions from people who make soy lecithin. And if that soy lecithin has a low enough protein level, FDA will allow an exemption. So you wanna make sure you're looking at that FDA list and seeing if you're buying that soy lecithin or globally there's some soy lecithins that have a much higher uh, protein level and can have a allergen and allergic reaction. So that's part of your risk assessment and also whether you need to do a validation study. Uh, for things like soy lecithin that could be used as a uh, lubricant as a processing aid. Um, you want to look at clean in place and clean out of place, sinks, tanks, pumps and CIP systems, and make sure you're doing an adequate job of breaking these things down, looking at gaskets and testing the right places for your allergy validation. Um, we see a lot of recalls for al ice cream and inclusions that get added, so things like walnuts, peanuts, and you know it's a validation issue, but also a processing uh, issue sometimes when the wrong inclusion is added. Um, for many years, there have been some issues uh, going from milk chocolate to dark chocolate because that's typically a dry cleaning process. Uh, it's something you'll, if you're using dry cleaning, you wanna make sure you're validating that and again, having that report available. Um, dry blending changeovers. There's some companies who have validated that say uh, a dry blending operation can be dry cleaned with salt or other mechanisms in order to get the allergen out. Again, I want to make sure that you're validating that and have a report with enough sampling that, that meets uh, what, what FDA would consider a validation. Uh, ovens sometimes can be difficult to clean, especially the older, longer tunnel ovens. You want to make sure that you're doing a validation of those. Or some companies have tried ashing and then validating that that ashed material is um, doesn't contain the allergen. I'll just caution you from a personnel safety and equipment safety perspective. You got to make sure that that uh, oven is capable of reaching that temperature that would cause the ashing. And then sanitary equipment design considerations. I talked about the conveyor belts that are easy to disassemble, disassemble and clean. Um, also, one thing that people often miss, there's metal detector equipment uh, that you can purchase that is cleanable from a sanitation perspective. They typically sell that to the meat companies that do a sanitation every night. Other metal detectables are not wet cleanable. So you want to make sure when you're buying equipment that you're buying something that you know you can control that allergen, especially if it's used for product before it's in the package. Um, spiral co coolers and freezers are another watch out, um, primarily because they're difficult to clean at the high levels. They're difficult to clean between belts and you've got product that can fall uh, through the spiral uh, cooler or freezer. So that's a big watch out that you make sure that you're validating. And we talked about the ingredient racking system. Okay, uh, just finished. Thank you all very much. And I'll uh, open it for questions. Excellent. Wow, that was a, uh, a very full presentation with lots of, of very valuable information, uh, you know, um, for those of us with family members with allergens, it's it's a very scary thing to see someone 
go into anaphylactic and it's a very important topic. Unfortunately, Tracy, your presentation went right to the end of your time and to be respectful of our other speakers schedules, we're going to need to take your questions uh, later, uh, potentially during the lunch break or maybe at the end of the day when we have the Q&A.